Huh. Uh, am I dying? No, that'd be too easy. Hi folks. I've got a problem with a Dodge. Uh, the problem is it's been kicking my butt for over a week. I don't know if I've seen anything quite like this. So I figured I'd bring you guys along. Just a fair warning. This is probably gonna be a lot of talking and looking at computer screens. If that's not your cup of tea, you might wanna bail out now. It's gonna be a lot more hair pulling than it is wrench pulling. So I've got a 2011 Dodge Ram 2500 with a 5.7 Hemi gas engine. The customer complaint is that randomly the throttle body warning light on the dash will come on and the RPMs jump up to 1500 and they're stuck there. You have no throttle response. And when you hit the brakes, it comes back down to idle, but as soon as you let off the brake, it goes right back up to 1500. That's some kind of a default strategy, like a limp home mode. The check engine light is on. It has two codes. It has a P2138 for APP1 and APP2 not correlated. This is a throttle by wire system. So your gas pedal is basically just a potentiometer, like a fuel sending unit. And it sends out a variable voltage to the PCM and the PCM decides how much to open the throttle body. For redundancy purposes, there are two potentiometers in the pedal, APP1 and APP2. And that code is saying that those two don't match each other the way that the computer thinks that they should. It also has a code P2128 for APP2 sensor high voltage. So it's saying that the voltage that's coming out of APP2 is higher than what it expects. I couldn't find a criteria that tells me what the threshold voltage is. Uh, it also says that it could also be a loss of the signal return, which is the ground to the APP2. So it's either high voltage or it's losing the, losing the ground. Anyway, this problem is extremely intermittent. And the hardest part of this whole thing has been figuring out how to duplicate the concern. I think I finally figured it out. It will do it pretty much every time on a cold start after it sat overnight. And once you start it up, it only acts up for about two or three minutes. After that, it starts to settle down. And once it kind of gets back to normal, it won't do it again for 24 hours. So, so yeah, that's a lot of fun. Anyway, we're gonna try to catch it. Uh, I've caught it a couple times, but I didn't have the right, the right equipment hooked up. Uh, the other complication is it's currently snowing. So yeah, we probably have to wait for that to, that to be over. Cause by the time I get it inside the shop, it'll already be, be too late. Yeah, here we go. So I'll show you guys what I found. Uh, this is the Launch X431 Pro V, I think. I've, their model numbers are very confusing because everything's an X431 and then there's like two different pros. Like, I don't know why they can't have an X432 or an X531. Anyway, in order to see or to play back recorded live data, you have to go to user info and then up here, it says recorded data. And these are all the, the recordings that it made. So let's just take a look here. So APP1 and APP2, that's our two outputs from the accelerator pedal. So we're going to go here to graph. And then we can hit play. Okay, this one seems to be normal. Let's go to this one. Okay, so in this recording, it's acting up 
and I have unplugged the connector from the accelerator pedal. And APP1 has gone to zero, and APP2 is, you know, somewhere around four volts. So right there, I plugged the pedal back in. And you can see it dropped the APP2, but it still isn't anywhere near where it should be. So APP2 should be half the voltage of APP1. So it should be 0.22. But this is, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. And it did it for, I want to say it did it for about three minutes. You know, long enough for me to get some data on the scan tool, but not long enough to get anything useful on the Pico scope. And I think that's where we, where we have to go if we want to figure this out. All right, now the tricky part. I've got to turn the key on in order to boot up the scan tool. And the problem is once we do that, that starts our counter. So you can see the values look normal. The green line is the signal return, the red line is the APP2, and the blue line is the five volt reference. I wish winter would just give up. It is nasty today. I used the launch the last time. I probably should use the same scan tool, but the graphing is better on the snap-on. Okay. So there's our APP1 and our APP2. Showing 0.2 volts coming out of it right now. This is key on engine off. We haven't started it yet. And on the scope, we've got the same thing. Looks good. Here we go, let's fire it up. Yeah, of course, it's not gonna do it today. God dang it. Get all this stuff set up and then it won't do it. All right, we caught it. I think we caught it. Yeah. Did we? So the APP2 is going crazy. Let's unplug it. Yeah, okay. What's causing that? This is very strange. Okay, so now it's happy. Very strange indeed. So it's got to be shorted somewhere in the harness. Alright guys, this is awesome. Not the weather. But check it out. I set up a fourth channel, which is the kind of golden color that you see here. And it's going crazy. The red is the APP signal at the ECM. The gold is the APP signal coming back from the harness. I cut the wire at the ECM and I'm measuring it on both sides. So it is not the computer. It's getting interference on that APP1 signal somewhere inside that harness. It's not the pedal. The pedal's unplugged right now. That's fantastic. I have no idea where it is. 
But yeah, that's the problem. That's crazy. It's gotta be shorted to something like a, a coil driver or an injector driver. Something that's only active when the engine's running. Yeah, that's awesome. Man, I'm glad we caught that. I was ready to put a computer in this thing. There's a connector, C120. I unplugged it. What if I plug it back in? I think I figured it out. That's the money shot right there. So just from that one waveform, some of you are going to know where we're headed. Uh, let's back up for a minute and talk about this accelerator pedal position sensor circuit. So there's a lot of liability associated with that circuit, as you can imagine. If it goofs up and your big old 5.7 Hemi there goes to full throttle and you plow through a parking lot full of handicapable children, somebody at Chrysler is going to be in a lot of trouble. So they built in some fail safes and redundancies to, to stop that from happening. I don't know if you guys remember, long time ago there was an Audi model where the throttle would stick and people were driving through their garage doors and I think they, there were even some people that were killed. It was a big legal debacle for Audi, plus they earned the moniker Accelerates Under Demonic Influence. Anyway, this sensor is pretty smart. It has two separate potentiometers. They are mechanically linked, but electronically they're completely separate. So they have separate five volt power supplies, separate signal returns, which is the ground, and of course, separate signal wires. They're both set up in a three wire voltage divider configuration, and the computer is monitoring the voltage of both of those sensors all the time. And to tell the difference between the two, they set it up so that the voltage of the APP1 is always twice the voltage of the APP2. And there must be some tolerance the computer's looking at, and if it sees that the voltage of one doesn't match what it sees from the voltage of the other, it's gonna set a code, and it's going to put the uh, truck into a default mode where it goes to 1500 RPM and you have basically have no throttle response and if you hit the brakes, it goes back down to an idle. It's kind of like a limp home mode. Uh, but there's also another, another check that it does, which can really throw you off. And it threw me off at first too. Uh, periodically, the computer will pull the APP2 signal to a ground. And you can see that on the scan tool. It'll be like steady voltage, all of a sudden it'll just drop out, and then go right back to its steady voltage, drop out. And I believe that's a check. If the computer sees the dropout on the APP1 and on the APP2, then it knows that the APP1 is shorted to the APP2. So it's like a further failsafe on that circuit. Anyway, what we did in our testing, the blue wire here is monitoring the five volt power supply for APP2 which is that wire right there. The red trace here is on the APP signal two. The yellow trace is also on the APP signal. And while it was goofing up, I cut that wire. So we were monitoring both sides of the circuit. Uh, the green wire was monitoring the, the signal return, which is the ground and when it goofed up, we were able to see that the problem was only on the harness side of the APP signal. So that means the problem has to be somewhere on the APP signal wire in the harness between here and the accelerator pedal position sensor. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm losing my voice. The blue is the five volt reference. The green is the signal return, that's the ground and the red is the signal wire at the PCM. Those are all fine. They're on a five volt scale. 
I don't see anything, anything weird with those. The problem is the yellow. That is the APP signal on the harness side. And in this capture, the pedal is unplugged and the wire to the ECM has been cut. So this voltage that you see here is coming from outside the normal circuit. And it's also on a 50 volt scale. So these peaks are around 25 volts. So that's the first clue. We had to have something that can create a voltage above 12 volts. And the other clue is the frequency. So I set up a cursor and it's about 80 milliseconds between those peaks. And if we do some math, assuming the engine's running at 1500 RPM, that would be 25 revolutions per second, which would be 0 0.04 seconds per revolution. It only fires the injectors and the spark plugs every other revolution. So that would be 0 0.08 seconds, which is 80 milliseconds. Which means that these peaks correspond exactly to the RPM of the engine. That's another clue. So let's get a zoom in on one of these waves. And I think we're going to see exactly what the problem is. Oh, come on, Wes. There it is. So does that waveform look familiar to anyone? It does to me. That is a classic injector control voltage waveform. I've even got a reference here. This is from Paul Danner's book. You guys know him as Scanner Danner. This is an amperage and voltage waveform for an injector. And you see it drops low, then you get the spike, then you have this little hump here that's called the pintle hump. That's actually where the pintle inside the injector mechanically moves. You can see it in the voltage waveform. And that matches exactly what we have on the screen. Uh, this book is great, by the way, if you guys don't have it. Engine Performance Diagnostics by Paul Danner. You can buy it from AES Wave. That's where I got it. Pretty good reference to have. Anyway, I believe what's happened is one of the injector control wires has shorted to the APP2 signal wire somewhere in the harness. It is super intermittent. I don't know which injector it is, and I'm now unable to duplicate this problem. I don't know, I guess we'll do a visual inspection. And if we can't figure it out, we either need a new engine harness or we need to do a wire overlay. I've wiggled, I've pulled, I've twisted. I don't see anything on the scope, but I did find something. And I think it might be the problem. Let's see if I can get you guys in here. Where is it? Right there. See right there on the mirror, or in the mirror? That harness goes past the sharp edge of that intake. And that looks pretty green to me. Of course, it's in the worst possible spot. All the way at the back. I'll try to peel that out of there and we'll see if we can find a, find a rub through wire. Well, looky, looky. Right there. Wonder if that's it. It's in a terrible spot. I can't possibly film tearing that apart. Let me get the tape off of it and hopefully we'll find a white wire with a brown stripe. I think that's it. It's got to be. The white wire is white with a brown stripe. That is our APP2 signal wire. The other one is brown with a blue stripe. And if we look right here at this injector harness, brown with a blue stripe. Can you guys see that? That one right there, brown with a blue stripe. That is diabolical. What's crazy is that they couldn't have been shorted together 
the manifold's plastic and the wires aren't, I mean, they aren't on top of each other. It had to be moisture, right? Like water carrying current between those two wires. I don't know. That's it, I gotta fix that spot in the harness and then we should be all set. Unbelievable, it really is. That's it folks, we are D-U-N done. Got the little caps put back on the connectors at the PCM. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but I zoom. I spliced those wires back together and then I put a little piece of heater hose over that harness to protect it from that sharp edge. That should be fine. Oh, what else? I put those connectors down by the tip them back where they should be. I've got to install the, the air intake and the beauty cover. Clear a few codes and we should be done with this pig. Somehow it has zero codes stored in the PCM. I don't know how that's possible. I had everything unplugged. I don't know. Let's clear them out anyway. Anytime, Chrysler. Okie dokie. Well, should run. Yeah, we're good. Except for that noisy rebuilt power steering pump I put on it. Let's get this beast out of here. I mean, other than the amount of time it took me to get it fixed, this guy should be pretty happy. A couple of butt splices and some tape, but otherwise, really no parts required. See if we can make our way around all the broken Chevys. Nope. Alright. I don't see any point in going on a test drive. I mean, I drove it several times and never had any issues. I think we'll just give it back to the customer and we'll let him drive it and we'll see what happens. I feel pretty confident though. I mean, what are the odds that there's there's more than one place where an injector control wire and the APP2 signal wire could short together? I guess it's possible, but I don't think so. All right, guys. In retrospect, that was pretty cool. But I'll be honest, there were several times during the process where if I had a bomb, I would have blown that thing up. I just, I didn't think we were ever gonna catch it. And, you know, that was the challenge with this diagnosis was duplicating the concern, you know, catching it in the act. And once we caught it on the scope, it really wasn't that hard to figure out what was going on. But in terms of duplicating the concern, that was probably the most challenging diagnosis that I've ever, I've ever done. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the, the Hyundai we did with the the metal hose clamp that was shorting the two injector wires together and shutting down that, that whole bank on the injectors. But even with that one, I was finally able to duplicate it in the bay. You know, here in the shop with the scope hooked up, I was able to catch it. But with that Dodge, I never could catch it in the shop. It was all in the parking lot, you know, howling wind and driving snow. And finally on the last go round, I did get it to act up long enough to get it inside and I could look at the waveforms and kind of tweak and push and pull the wiring harness, but it didn't really do us any good. And the irony is I spent all that time whining about the, the weather and how terrible it is, but I think the bad weather was crucial to this diagnosis. At least if I'm thinking about it right, there's no way, I don't think there's any way that those two wires could have actually shorted to each other. The intake manifold is plastic, the wires, you know, they're not on top of each other, they're beside each other in the, in the loom. So I'm thinking it had to have moisture to complete that circuit. So without, you know, the rain and, 
and sleet and snow and whatever we've had here recently, I'm not sure we would have ever duplicated that problem. And it also explains why, you know, it only happens on a cold start. And as soon as the engine warms up and dries out, the problem goes away. So yeah, that is very tricky. But yeah, the scope was crucial for this diagnosis and especially catching the problem on the scope was crucial. Anyway, we got there in the end. Uh, I do want to thank a couple people, uh, Eric O at South Main Auto and Keith Perkins. I believe his channel is called L1 Automotive, uh, Auto, Automotive Training, L1 Automotive Training. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, those guys walked me through how the APP2 circuit works and explained those random dropouts to zero that we're seeing on the live data. Uh, I was really confused by that. So big thanks to those guys for, for helping me out and thanks to you guys for watching. I guess the other thing that people always want to know is how I charge or how much I charge for a weird diagnosis like this. And there's no easy answer to that question. So usually the way it works here is I give myself an hour and after an hour, I usually have some idea of, of where we're headed, but with an intermittent problem like this, you know, there's no way to know how deep the rabbit hole goes. So it's just, it's just time and materials and yeah, we either go until the job's done or the customer runs out of money. In this case, I charged five hours and if I'm being honest, that's, that's barely going to cover the amount of time that I have in this thing. I probably set up the scope and the scan tool 10 times, you know, and every time you drag that stuff out in the parking lot and set it up, it takes 15 or 20 minutes and I only caught it twice. So, you know, I wasted a lot of time and yeah, somebody has got to pay for that. And I guess if he doesn't like that, he can, he can take it to the dealership where, where I'm sure it would have gotten a PCM and an accelerator pedal and maybe eventually a harness, but I think the harness is obsolete. So I'm not sure what they would have done there. Anyway, that's how it works here. So thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.